Hi everyone and welcome to the prep video for lesson 6 in this series on developing a survival game. You might notice the background changed. We've reached the point where I no, run out of uh, uncorrupted recordings and we're entering the peer record re-record phase. This series and this video have been brought to you by my Patreon sponsors like Random Number Generator. That said, let's make a start with this prep video. So in the tutorial, we're going to cover a few topics around our stamina system. So we're going to have a set of variables. Like before, we're going to have current and max, just like we do with health. But we're going to have a stamina timer, because we're going to use a timer to reduce or increase our stamina depending on particular situations. And I'm going to go over in this video, this prep video, the differences between a tick and a timer very, very briefly, because there's a lot to get into on that topic. And there's a lot of debates on that topic as well. We'll also have a sprint stamina cost. So when, the sprint, when a character is sprinting, it will reduce stamina at a certain rate and will be constant based on that variable. We're doing that just so we can have well, a single variable for it. And we'll be tying, clearly, our sprint system to our stamina system. We will have a set of functions. We'll have a deplete stamina and increase stamina function, which will work as setters. And then we'll have two getters. Really, I shouldn't ch say check stamina as a getter. It is a pure function, but it really isn't a getter. And then we have our get stamina, which is a true getter. And as I promised in the last prep video, I'll also talk about what setters and getters are. And we'll have an implementation of our system using timers, as I've already mentioned. And this is something that just loops over and over again based on a timer. Not all timers loop. We will make ours looping by hitting a little checkbox that says loop. So let's get started by talking about ticks and timers. So ticks. When to, usually when we're talking about ticks, we're talking about the event tick, as you can see in the picture under the word there. So what is a tick? A tick is an event that fires at a specific rate. And in this case, it is every frame, which means the refresh rate is the key thing here. It is refresh rate dependent. And there are ways that you can control for that. Now I say this, however, there are interval ticks and interval ticks do not fire every frame. Thus the word typically there. And I will bring up interval ticks again. So you might have heard, ticks are bad. Avoid them. They're evil. They're the worst thing in the world. Why is that? Well, this comes from an area of FUD, which stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Ticks aren't bad. What people mean to say, or don't know because there's that uncertainty and doubt, is that ticks are bad when they're improperly used. And that, to be fair, happens more often than not, at least in things I have seen. I will let you work out, you know, what I mean by that. It should be kind of obvious if you can read between the lines there. So, what is good use versus bad use then? And that really boils down to a few things. First, remember that the tick fires every frame. This means that your game is busy running the tick event and not other aspects of your game. And this can lower uh, your frame rate. Second, think, this is gonna fire every frame, no matter what, my keyword, no matter what there, by the way. And ask yourself, do you need it to fire every frame? And no, putting a branch on a tick or a uh, check to see if it continue firing isn't any better. So just bear that in mind. It's going to fire every frame. It's going to use resources. Do you need it to do that? And again, somehow stopping a tick, like putting a stamina system on a tick and having it, all the checks that we're going to put in there doesn't make it any better. In fact, actually, it's a waste of resources. So there's some more things we should know about ticks. For starters, a tick, again, an event tick, as I said, typically fires every frame. But as I've already said, 
you can change how often they fire with a custom setting, which you can find under an actor's class defaults. This is known as an interval tick. And interval ticks still have some similarities with the regular sort of tick that fires every frame. And those similarities are everything that's about to follow, by the way. Either a tick is on or off. And there's a bit of control over how often it fires. Thus, the interval ticks is the only control you get. And you really can't change that once it's started. If the tick is on, it is on until the actor is destroyed. So when I say destroyed, I mean removed from memory. As long as that actor exists in memory, that tick is firing. If, assuming the tick is on. Some caveats to remember though with ticks. AI ticks work differently, at least in Unreal. They, from my understanding of them and the documentation I have read, and I am going to double check this after, as we get towards the AI section, they do actually cease firing when, when they're asked to cease firing. They, they can be destroyed without destroying the actor. And you can create them differently in C++. And in fact, Honestly, I'm going to say in a minute or two that you should use uh, ticks in C++. When I say should use in C++, I mean if you're going to use a tick, do so in C++, not in Blueprint. One of the things I've seen often said in forums, if you're doing ticks, go wild if you're doing them in C++. You can also create more ticks in C++, and you can have them at firing at different rates. And in that regard, they're a bit more akin to the timer and BPs, but... That is a very, very surface level description. And I'm sure every programmer who knows about ticks in C++ and Unreal just kind of clenched and cringed at me a bit. But if that's the level at which you understand it, that's good enough for now. So, what is my advice? Avoid ticks where possible. Use them for prototyping and rapid tests. Um, so I will often use ticks when I'm prototyping something just to make sure that it's firing and working the way I expect every part to work. Only use them if you truly need it every frame. Sometimes certain animations, sometimes certain events. I have in other series violated this rule mostly because I'm trying to teach a logic structure, not good design. Do ticks uh, in C++ where possible, as I said, and don't be afraid of ticks. There's a lot of fear around them. So what is our alternative to ticks? That would be timers. Timers are similar to ticks, but they can change the speed at which they're fired. We can change them. They can be paused. They can be completely turned off. And really important here, they are not frame rate dependent. These things typically, when we're working in blueprints, make timers more efficient because we have more control. Because we have more control, because we can pause and turn them off, we're no longer using that space of memory. Because they're not frame rate dependent, we are sure it's always going to fire at the same rate on everybody's system. And typically, we want to use timers where possible. All right, so that brings us through a very brief overview of ticks versus timers, and it is brief. I realize I'm nine minutes into this, but trust me, there's a lot more on this topic out there. I do recommend reading the forums, either Reddit or Epic's forums, or even Stack Overflow, but honestly, it's not the best for this area. On ticks versus timers, that is, regarding the differences and when to use them. Because there are some caveats I haven't covered as well, and some points I haven't covered, and more nuance to this than is really up here. But this is just an introduction to the topic. All of that said, let's move on to setters and getters. So, what is a setter? A setter is a method or a function that changes or sets a value of a variable. Typically, a setter is an impure function. An impure function is used when you're modifying a variable's value or state or running a calculation where you're gonna set something. It has an input or an argument that goes into it. And you can sometimes directly set a value with this argument. So you have a set health variable. 
And all you do is you take your health variable and plug the input pin into the, or the set pin into the input node of a function. And you put say the value 50 in, whatever your health is, it's going to be changed to 50. We haven't done that. We've done the other method of setting, which is where we modify a value. So think of our health system. We put a value in, we either add or subtract that from the current health and then change the current health to that value. So those are two different methods of setting a value. You can see in one there's a calculation per my earlier comment on impure functions with calculations. Next, we have getters. And what's a getter? Well, a getter retrieves or gets information about a variable. Typically, and I do stress typically because we will be using impure getters in this series, but we'll talk about that in video nine's prep. So a pure function does not modify a value. A pure function can also be used for getters as we're doing here or used to output a value. So our check has stamina is actually outputting a value. It's outputting a true or false based on a floats value. You can do calculations in getters if you're not setting anything, you just need to get a particular value which we'll be doing a lot of actually in this series. We'll be doing that with our um, inventory system when we make our UI for that. It always has an output, typically one, but not always one. Sometimes you'll have more. And in fact, we'll actually do that a couple of times, I think during the inventory or equipment system. And it does not have an input typically or an argument. That should say typically, sometimes it does. Sometimes you're gonna be passing in, I want to get something from this and I have multiple or whatever this is. Uh, but typically it does not have an input, typically. So why do we use setters and getters? Well, simply put, good encapsulation. As we mentioned earlier, other classes should not have direct, a direct access to variables of another class. They, they should only have access to themselves. Now there are some caveats to this in C++, there's something known as friends of class, but that's gonna be different. Um, and we'll talk about that when we do our inventory UI actually, because we will have hard references and I'll talk about hard references in a video or two, I think in the first UI video, uh, so video eight of the series, we'll talk about hard references. But when we do our, our we, we have things called friends of class. Don't worry about those quite yet. Typically though, uh, and also we have uh, children classes. Again, we'll talk about that at the very start of our inventory tutorials. Um, those might have access directly to other classes, but typically we do not want another class to have direct access. So think of my example from a few prep videos ago of the bird and the tree. The bird only cares about the bird. The bird cares about flying, pecking, nesting, mating, eating, um, singing, what have you. The tree cares about growing, leaves moving, that sort of stuff. It might, the tree might have a function that says, hey, if there's something here, don't grow leaves there. That's something being a nest. It doesn't know it's a nest. The bird lands there. The bird communicates with the tree, hey, please don't, please note that this is where the nest is. So it, it's able to, get the information or the tree is able to get the information of the nest location from the bird, but it doesn't get anything else. It just gets that information on the nest location. Typically variables should be private or protected. And we'll talk about this later in the series. Setters and getters allow access to those variables as they are typically public. The functions are public that is. And based on the two points above, it is an effective method of protecting data. In other words, it's good encapsulation. And finally, it allows for better control and ease of debugging, better control of the variable, better control of your classes and your methods, and it makes debugging easier. All right, that takes us through what we need to cover for this video. I hope you enjoyed this prep. I hope you've learned something from it, and I hope you enjoy our actual tutorial video. This series and this video have been brought to you by my Patreon sponsors like Rian, 
Quad Manson, and Haynes. I look forward to seeing you in the tutorial video and hope that you have a wonderful day.